Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to Tia No, the last days of Mexico. I'm your host, Mr. Mexico. Um, but flying in front, flying the friendly skies. Flight is one of the great inventions of mankind. Before limited to just scrambling a horse stuck to the ground, now humanity is unlimited access to the skies. It's a beautiful endeavor that is conveniently much faster than any other mode of transportation. Emilio believed that every part of a mechanism should suit the grandness of its purposes and our parts were grand temples to a modern technological wonder. As a member of the Guadalajara International Airport Help Desk, Emilio played a small but important role in this mechanism. His duty was to guide customers through the flying experience as best as possible. Emilio had watched as, over the years, the airport had been transformed from the inside out. Under the new airport and auxiliary services administration, there had been a flurry of new rules and regulations not only for the passengers, but for the employees like him in addition to expanding the runways and constructing new terminals. They've implemented strict bordering procedures in anticipation and facilitation of an increased volume of flights. From his desk, Emilio watched as a previously unorganized trickle of customers transformed each day into a long straight lines. While the new process of paperwork and documentation checks was tedious, but superior to the wild days of old. Excuse me, one such customer split off from the back of the line, approaching him angrily. If you don't mind me saying this, this is ridiculous. I paid a lot of money for this flight, now I have to submit all this paperwork? I had no idea. What do you guys get off? Emilio manufactured a well-rehearsed, polite smile and replied, I assure you, sir, once you balloon all the new requirements, boarding will be as easy as a breeze. Another day, another satisfied customer. What do we want here? I like this one, too. 50%, 50%. Imperial will decrease, 5 million. But this helps base stimulation, and I like base stimulation. I want to do both, in all honesty. Hmm. Farming productivity is 42%. Over here, it's what? 41%. Every place is at least slightly productive, which is good. 600 million. Uh, that's almost there. We're going to do this. Well, I'll do this one too. Why not? Screw it. Anything else we really care about too much? Not so much. Ooh. Attract American investors. That's still good to do too. But I still want to do this one as well. Because do we really need to do anything here? Uh, let's save our political power for now. The secrets of black gold. Just because the oil is there doesn't mean automatically mean it'll be benefit us. Obviously, first we must get it out of the ground. Pemex director and the PRI insider Jesus Reyes Herales carefully lifted a cup of coffee from a silver platter that the president Ordaz's assistant had provided for the two men's meeting. They must account for the quality and type of oil. You must choose how and what you'll transform the petroleum into. Herales sco scooped two spoonfuls of sugar into his drink, stirring the mixture with an ornate spoon. Finally, you must get the final product where you need it and customers want it. Gasoline is only useful when you put it into a car after all. Herodes took a satisfying sip of his drink and joined the rich flavors. It's all worth it, but the whole process is complicated and get, gets more complicated every year. That's why we need the Mexican Petroleum Institute to perform, so we can stay on top of the market. I understand that well enough. Do you already have somebody in mind to have the Institute Jesus? Ordaz slowly served his coffee before drinking it. Straight black, no need for frivolities. Let the coffee serve him, not the other way around. It's kind of like me. He must be someone who knows his role. He must understand this is not a charity nor some purely academic affair. The IMP is to be an organ of the PRI and exist to improve the Mexican economy no more, no less. I know just the man. Herodes really placed down his cup and slid over in a closed dossier to the president. He tapped the saucer near, nearby, or nervously. Usually one for calm civility, Herodes really was excited. This organization was his brainchild and he believed his research would greatly improve Pemex operations. Javier Barro Sierra, a very talented engineer and administrator. An academic, too. Ordaz kept a firm grasp of his coffee as he studied the dossier. I just hope he's up for the job. I don't need a flake in my administration. You need to ensure its commitment. Anything can be bought or sold for the right oil. In the city of Tehuantepec. In the city of Tehuantepec, in the city of Oaxaca, there's recently been a very fortunate discovery. A new major reserve of petroleum has been found, which could raise our oil production to 177 million barrels by the start of the next decade. There can be no doubt about it. This is a great opportunity. Effective immediately, the IMP and Pemex must expand all needed resources to begin drilling and properly exploiting this resource. We simply cannot waste any time. Money trees. Agriculture. Uh, where's peasant loyalty? Industrial loyalty is good. Peasant loyalty, we can hit harm quite a bit. And the loyal bulwark, peasant loyalty will increase. Um, I kind of don't mind doing this one. Farming productivity goes up by 1% more loyalty from peasants, which doesn't mean very much. We do money trees. Uh, I want to get this one here too. Modernize Pemex first. Pemex, uh, Petroles Mexicanos, is one of the greatest successes of the Institutional Revolutionary Party. Its founding is one of the most masterful decisions made by the exalted president Lazaro Cardenas. 
But just like with the success of Lopez Mateos, more can be done to build up this great legacy. Pemex it must be modernized and its focus widened so it can exploit natural gas and create petrochemicals. By the decree of President Ordaz, Pemex will be massively expanded to exploit and dis discover reserves and continue the great works of the industrialization of these United Mexican states. Finishing the job. Oh, that's not good. The fires of the ancient or the socialist revolution provided a fitting backdrop for the trial of Arturo Gamis. The vast plumes of smoke erupted from the Jimenez liquor distillery and manner were joined by countless smaller streams as peasants burned the streets to de sheet to death like cacacues had forced on them. After the last Cadillo of Cibadilla and his quartered men had surrounded to Salvador Gaetan's column, the peasants had surged straight for those supported, supposed records, those lies. The bounty of the Jimenez cellar endowed the proceedings with a carnivalesque, uh, carnival-esque atmosphere. GPG members would take turns swinging or swigging tequila and keep guns trained to the Cadillos and their disarmed goons. Rural police turned revolutionaries who would hurl abuse at a bata in Rascomba between bites of carnes asada. A tipsy Jacobo was triggering to contain a broad grin behind the stern mask of revolutionary justice. Emilio Rascon barked Mayor Sal Salomon Gaetan, you are hereby charged with robbery, kidnapping, the assault, of the killing of Pepe Martinez, and exploitation of the good people of Cibadilla. What say the people to these charges? A resounding cry went up in the air, and Arturo nodded, convicted, and sentenced to death by firing squad. Jesus Fernandez and Pablo Gamet led a shaking out of scones still clutching his wounded arm to the side of the distillery. Maria and an assortment of his former tenants trailed eagerly behind, holding a clutch of borrowed firearms. The ragtag fusillade that followed almost eclipsed Salomon shot Florentino Ibarra. And that's why I get my political power here. We did not need cooperation. What could have been? Oh, look at that. Ernesto Orochurtu stared out of his office window at people milling about the, the Zocalo. Watching scenes of urban activity used to be pleasant, but now he left only felt a deep melancholy. These people in the city were no longer his. I finished sorting through your files, said a secretary from the doorway. Do you mind, or do you need help packing up the things in here? No, thank you. I'll handle it. In truth, Orochurtu had barely started packing. His mind was elsewhere. He didn't regret blowing up at the president. Ordaz was a fool in a so-called promotion didn't interest Orochurtu in the slightest. Yet after nearly 13 years in charge of the federal district, he wasn't prepared to say goodbye. His desk, desk was strewn with documents, plans for beautiful new parks, for boulevards lined with flower beds, and for countless other public works. There was a whole file on infrastructure that could reduce traffic without the need for that infernal metro. With his departure, none of it would ever see the light of day. As he reflected on his long tenure, he realized that the title Iron Regent had been misleading. He had wielded immense power only when the president supported him. Now the president wanted him gone, and his ambitions had shattered like glass. With the final side, he began collecting his things. Well, what do you expect when you piss off the president? Oh, would you look at that? The third aftermath. My god. How much more do we have to deal with here? Seriously. Come on. So, target is 20 and 10. 20 and 10. So this is okay. We still want to intimidate union members. I don't know if we can get that much command power, maybe. A warning. Madrazo didn't know what to expect when he and Laura Ortega were caught into the president's office. When he saw Ordazo's face contorted in frustration, he knew it could be good. I got a call from Governor Prade uh, Praxedes Gidnar Duran this morning, or Daz began coldly. Apparently, the party saw fit to remove the head of the Chihuahua's uh, state committee. Yes, Madrazo replied, the man publicly criticized our, our reforms, and we have evidence that he rigged his primary election to stay in office. Do you two have any idea what you're doing? Gidnar Duran is furious, and the other governors are taking his side. You're meddling in the affairs of the loyal state government is tearing the party apart. For Madrazo, or take a good response, or Daz are outside. Please, spare me your speeches. I understand that your work is important. But I still, and I still sympathize with the cause, but you need to be more cautious. Something like this cannot happen again, understood? As the two men ex exited the president's office, Madrazo felt ill at ease. Our plans are causing quite a bit of chaos. Perhaps for Gustavo's sake, we should slow it down. I don't think that's wise, Ortega replied. You said it yourself. Facing opposition means we must be doing something right. We are fighting to purify a party tainted by corruption and careerism. Uh, the reforms may be painful now, but we need them to secure the PRS future. We can't give up now. Oh boy. I don't understand what what's the point of this at this point. I'm I'm so tired of the stupid union stuff. I'm strike strikes. Like, come on. Uh, haggling. Uh, General Del Rosal wound his way through the busy streets of uh, Yujitan de Zaragoza. He had arrived in the town that morning after a marathon train journey from the federal district. He was to meet his escort at the town hall. From there, he would be driven to the newly established drilling sites for inspection. He rounded a corner and found the street choked by a sea of bright oh, awnings. De Rosal walked under the damp shade. All sorts of goods were piled on the stalls from fresh produce to hand-built pottery. Every few steps, one of the traders, all women, would accost him and insist he buy something from their stall. Every time he would scowl and refuse. He had almost cleared the market when he spotted someone pointing at him. 
Her eyes flickered with recognition as she spoke to a friend in a Zeppo deck before stepping into the aisle, blocking Bill Rosal's exit. The woman standing before him was as young. She wore a deep frown in her round face and wore black hair and a braid. Uh, you're General Del Rosal, she announced. Uh, as much uh, to the rest of the market as him. You've come here to take our oil and you can't even spare a few pesos at her stalls. People began to stare. Del Rosal's suit clung to his skin. He glared at her and then finished a few coins, fished a few coins out of his pocket. A few minutes later, he arrived at the front of the town hall with a rug rolled under his arm. An idling truck waited to ferry him away. Del Rosal's driver spotted the woman, Matt, and raised an eyebrow. It's a long story, Del Rosal snapped. So, we gotta keep up political power and meet the new boss. Everyone understand? As a former president and new Olympic organizing chief committee uh, chairman, Adolfo Lopez Mateos, all right, I think this was a successful meeting. Let's get back to work. As members of the organizing committee left, Vice Chairman Ramirez went over to him and said, Welcome to the team, Mr. President. Glad your successor had the good judgment to put you in charge. I hope the job was mine. I just had to ask for it. But it's great to be working with you, Pedro. Now I guess we're a firm instead of a client and contractor. Seems that way, said Ramirez. With a bit of effort, we're going to pull off the greatest event since the centennial celebrations. It doesn't feel real, Lopez says he looked at a model of the Olympic Stadium with enhancements. The first Olympic Games in Latin America. Our chance to show ourselves off to the world. We're really making this an event, too. A full year of cultural festival. Thousands of people from across the globe and millions joining by TV. In this moment, Mexico can shake off the chains of the past and come forth as an international prosperous state. It's going to be your legacy, Pedro, not the presidency or the buildings. Those will matter to the world. What does matter is our lifetimes. You and I are going to be to see a troubled country finally declare it to the world as it arrived. No longer will it be the butt of jokes or our, or our land or forgotten backwater. These games will be a source of pride and inspiration to all. Adolfo? I know the gosh darn migrant, he said, rinsing. Let's find some part, someplace dark. It seems to be happening more frequently. And the Caracas connection. An ongoing rise in demand for Mexican oil could, be, could mean that in the future our own production may be incapable of meeting it. This potential supply of strangulation must be nipped in the bud before it becomes a genuine problem. Fortunately, we have a potential resource available to us our fellow petroleum producers in Venezuela. Meeting with President Wolfgang Lazarabal of Venezuela, we could have a strong trade deal to resolve this conundrum. There's no candidate superior to Venezuela, which is a fellow OFN friendly, stable Latin American state. We certainly want to risk, wouldn't want to risk wild cards like the Argentines and the inferior YPF, now would we? Opportunity knocks twice. It's these university students, Jesus. They think the world owns them, owes them everything. All they have to do is demand it. Can you imagine riding like this when we were kids? Pemex director Jesus Reyes Herales, her prospective IMP head, Javier Barrios, or Barros and Sierra's tiny laugh through the, his worn phone headset. The two men were discussing the recent National Autonomous Union, uh, uh, Union Autonomous University Mexico student strike. For the good kids, I appreciate their passion, even if it can be misplaced at times. That's definitely something to watch, Javier. It's a shame that the reactor <coughs> rector had to resign. I suppose that's what's what you get for not being able to control your students. With his free hand, Harold is took a sip of his coffee. He jerked the cup away from his mouth, cold. He had waited too long and had wasted a perfectly good drink. He sat the coffee down on his desk next to some building plans. It was a long pause before Sierra began speaking again. Jesus, the UNAM's governing board, they called me yesterday. They offered me a job director. I'm sorry, but I'm going to take it. I appreciate you thinking of me for the IMP job. Another pause weighed heavily on the conversation before Harold was able to respond. He held his tongue in silence to regain his composure. If Sierra could see him, he would not be able to hide his anger so well. Congratulations, Sierra. I'm sure you'll make a great leader for those kids. Listen, I gotta go. Speak with you soon. Wow, the deficit's really bad now. Before Sierra could respond, Harold slammed down his phone receiver. The force knocked over his coffee cup, ruining his IMP plans. Harold sighed, took a beat, and then returned to work. He pulled open a cabinet drawer filled with flowers he thought he wouldn't have to read again. Within, within these names, he would we'll have to be the next IMP general director, uh, director general. Man, I can't speak. I'm sorry, guys. I just cannot speak in this episode. University director is too safe of a job for such a man. And this is what we want to mobilize the DFS too. A case of fraud. Ooh. As the second round of primary elections draw to a close, the state of Sinaloa delivered some unexpected results. Every state official, including those to be corrupt and wildly unpopular, won their elections. It's well, obvious that uh, Governor Leopoldo Sanchez said this. I tampered with the primaries, but he categorically denied these accusations and refused any request for new elections. The governor has us in a tough spot, L Laurel Ortega complained of Madrazo. His meddling has made a mockery of his primary system, but without the cooperation of any state officials, we're powerless in Sinaloa. Madrazo frowned. We're not powerless, we have options. If he refuses to work with the National Executive Committee, we can pay him back in kind. I'm just worried about the party's stability. The President told us to be cautious, remember? If he chooses to fight back, it'll be a massive escalation. Well, Carlos Ortega replied, consider the alternative. 
If Sanchez Sales gets away with blatant rigging, then our primary elections are fatally compromised. Before long, every governor will be doing the same thing. What's the point of our reforms if we're not willing to fight for them? For a moment, Madrazo's frown deepened, and his face became stern. You're right. Sanchez Sales has crossed the line and still may face the consequences. The pure eye will pull out of Sinaloa completely. We'll cut off all financial aid and federal assistance until he accepts our demands for new elections. The decisive struggle is at hand. Uh, loyalty will increase, but as well cronyism. Recognize hard work. Loyalty will decrease, which you don't like. Criticize criminal activities. It's the best way for that one. Changing of the guard, prefer the Nordaz way to patiently set the federal district building. Just a short walk away from the Palacio Nacio now, the atmosphere in these offices are quite different. Officials and secretaries crisscross the building excitedly, anticipating the arrival of their new boss. At last, Ordal saw a figure at the entrance. It was the man they'd all been waiting for, General Del Rosal. You're five, my, you're five minutes late. Not the best way to start your first day. Alfonso Corona. Del Rosal laughed. My apologies, Your Excellency. I saw us on the way here and I knew I had to have a copy. The general handed over a newspaper. Ordal smiled as he read the headline Del Rosal named as new regent, Federal District in Good Hands. In good hands indeed, General. Tell me, what will be your first priorities region of the Federal District? Del Rosal smiled back. I'll need a few days to settle my new office and get the lay of the land. After that, I'd like to do something big. I think it's high time the city got a metro system, don't you? I couldn't agree more, General, with that replied. I'd like to have the metro completed as soon as possible. The federal government will support construction however we can. The region's gone, long live the region. There you go. How much debt do we have? We have so much. Cancun project? Yeah, I'd love to do this one. I should have done that before. Um, new electricity plant, so we gotta do something else other than that. How much money do we have to spend? 40, 4 million, 50 million. Either one of these two, it doesn't matter. Let's go with that one. I'm also waiting for Belt Ejitos, because we need that political power pretty badly, actually. Oh, this is so stupid. So stupid. Roughnecks. We need to hike to the edge of a forest of old derricks where the sulfuric stench lessened. The muscles in his arms throbbed and his back, ache, back ached. That half hour break for lunch was a godsend. Benito found his bunkhouse, one, one of about 20 low rectangular buildings on the edge of the worksite. In the current common area, his workers uh, crowded around an aluminum folding table. They were grumbling about Ordaz's moves to expand and modernize Pemex. I don't see the problem, Benito cut in, running a filthy hand through his wavy hair as he removed his hard hat. Getting in new equipment will save lives. Um, it'll make our work heck of a lot easier, and if half the planted plan expansions go through, we'll never be out of a job again, but you need to always met with stony glares. I'll give the kid a break, Enrique said. He was the oldest man there, in his late 40s, still strong, but age was gaining on him. He wasn't there in 58. What happened in 58? We went on strike with the railway workers. What does not even try to negotiate? That son of a gun marched soldiers into the oil fields and train depots. Dragged their leaders off to uh, La Converi. God knows what happened to them after that. Sans gripped the bunkhouse. Enrique's eyes fixed on something very far away. But he couldn't understand. They all hoped he would never have to. You know what? I need political power. Oh, it's going to hurt our death, so we do get more um, uh, growth. Just a little bit more. But I need that. We have to have that political power. This is so stupid. When is this going to be done? I'm honestly annoyed at this po at this point. It's not it's not fun anymore. <laughs> like, come on. How many more times do we have to do this? I should just kill them all. God, I could be such a good leader someday. Uh, let's see. Cash crops such as pineapples, bananas, cacao, mangoes, and vanilla are the future of agriculture. They're as close as reality can get to pesos growing on plants and trees. Their profitability, arising from how in demand they are in foreign markets, help them bring in large amounts of money to the economy and therefore passively manage increases. Massively increases tax revenue as they are permitted to proliferate. Though the CNC and farmers are likely to complain, we'll do this for the good of Mexico, we'll promote cash crops. No, more than economics. Uh, the ballroom of the Ministry of Economy and Finance in Caracas buzzed with activity. A reception, lined with all sorts of cuisine from all around the Caribbean and Mexico, as well as a full array of drinks and activities, was prepared. The undersecretary was chatting with the staff when the door opened, signifying the arrival of the Mexican ambassador. Ah, Luis Rodriguez, you finally made it. Glad to, have, glad to have you here. The two traveled down the line, talking to one another as they put food on the plates. Rodriguez comp complimented the setup. You guys have outdone yourself here. Thanks for having us. The trade deal was a pleasure to sign. Of course, sir, we figured this wasn't only about the trade deal, but a celebration of all of our mutual achievements in the recent past. I sat down with the ambassador digging into his meal and reminiscing. How about that Trujillo, huh? 
Laughter spread across the table. Thank God we got the guy. And after being the Spanish Republican refugees in the fall of France, it felt good to finally get back at the fascists. Hopefully, with acts like this, we can shift the tide back towards liberty. Felt good over here, too. As we got that. 14 days. That's going to take forever to do. Um, decrease by one. That's not good enough. I want three. Or at least, or age decree. Deadlock. Furthermore, uh, the salaries of doctors and residents interns shall be raised by 7%. The room exploded into chaos. The chairman of the AMMM folded the letter and placed it back into the envelope. It would give them time to weigh their options before a decision was made. Somewhere in the turmoil, Dr. Celino, Celino beamed. Her family and Leon would never know want or hunger. She turned to Emilio, a young intern from the federal district she had met during the previous work stoppage. This is wonderful. I can't believe it. We won. She pulled him into a tight hug before realizing he did not share her joy. It's more about uh, than just pain now, Dr. Celino, Emilio retorted. We need to keep the strike going until they recognize our union if we want to keep any of the gains we've made. Dr. Salino's small fate him. We need to be willing to negotiate, Emilio. So just roll over and take their offer? We need to guarantee fair representation in the future. We won't have any representation of our dossings so we'll never be satisfied, Dr. Salino snapped. The meeting's adjourned. No decision has been made. Of course. For the love of God, we got other things to deal with in this. A cyclone's fury. Uh-oh. While well, his standoff with Governor Sanchez Sales was heating up, Carlos Madrazo visited Yelisco to speak at a rally. His face was worn and tired, but his eyes blazed with the energy and fury that had made him famous. The PRI was a part of the Mexican Revolution, or so we claim. If it ever was a revolutionary party, then the time was coming on. Gasps of shock echoed throughout the audience. Madrazo continued becoming more animated by the second. The PRI has lost touch with the political realities of modern Mexico. On the local and state level, corruption runs rampant, turning swaths of the country into petty fiefdoms. Social causes, the like of the pleasantry, plight of the peasantry, are being neglected. The crowd was electrified, feeling the truth of every word. The reporters and attendants could hardly believe their luck. Here was the president of the PRI openly denouncing his own party. This would certainly be front page news. This refusal to accept political reality is no accident. The PRI is full of careers from the rank and file to the very top. My fight to rid the party of these corrosive forces hasn't been easy. I've been slandered, insulted, and opposed at every turn, but I'll not stop fighting. No matter how much they try to get rid of me, I'll continue to build a better PRI for the party, nation, and for you, the people. As the audience erupted into cheers, Madrazo will savor the moment. He didn't yet appreciate how explosive his speech had been, or how dire the consequences would be. Passion is important, but so is tact. And assignment to, or assigned to Argentina. So, now, despite repeated defeats, humiliations, corruptions, and corrections, that clique of Japanese file technocrats under Salinas still haunts the government under the Ordaz administration. This should not be permitted to continue, as best to find a way to simultaneously elevate and castrate this threat. Let us assign Salinas and his allies to political dead end postings in the deep south of the country, far away from the usual base of power, though their skills will be of great economic utility, we'll never be able to profit from them politically. They'll learn first sandwich from the meaning of the dictum, responsibility without power, the prerogative of the Inuch throughout the ages. Oh, look at that. Deny audience requests. Really, it's the entrance we gotta focus on. This sucks, but I mean, we have to do what we have to do, but reaction. It's easy to mock teachers and students from the comfortable office, Governor Guinard Duran. The GPG's letter mocked Paraxedes Guinard Duran from the Herald. The countless words mocked him from the di Diario. A veined hand hoisted that office telephone to his pale lips, soon they would mock him no more. It is easy to send soldiers to die, just like you did during your revolution, and blotches of dark blood sprouted like blackberries amidst the gray, gray dirt of Las Moras. The 52nd Infantry Battalion was scattered after Jacopo lured them away into an ambush by Arturo Gamiz in the book of the column. But this blood wasn't the soldiers, it was Yemi's. It was Tomas's, it was Maria's. What is difficult, Governor, is to take up arms. The boom of the shotgun sounded again. Its companion echoed a second later. First, the flimsy barn wall of Las Aguilas ranch was ripped through, and then Wilfredo was centimeters away from Salvador Gaetan's left shoulder. Shotguns remained silent thereafter, hit by Pablo Gomez's men from behind the farmhouse. But after a few wretched gasps, silence reclaimed Wilfredo as well. Come to the Sierra. The mountains were cool that night, the campfire was quieter, sparser. Our thorough Jacobo and their comrades drank two to more uh, victories for the GPG, for the Socialist Revolution, for the working people of Mexico. But the mezcal tasted like blood in their mouths. And stop us. West African Alliance, huh? Trickle down agriculture. On a mountainous, uh, a mountain site, Egito and Veracruz, local farmers take a break from the hard work for lunch. Using logs and crates as tables and chairs, they share bits of food to make a meal. The tree canopy above protects them from beating sun, but provides little reprieve from the sweltering heat. The humidity which cultivates the greenery around them is also the source of their sweat. The men and women ate without conversation, the sound of chewing and swaying leaves accompanied by a battered radio singing garbled ballads. The meal is interrupted by the arrival of a sputtering truck up the steep road. Good afternoon, a man steps out of the passenger side of the now parked truck. He wore a long sleeve white shirt unfitted for the humid weather and his body it tightly clung to. 
The farmers recognized the man as a local CNC representative, a bureaucrat for the National Peasant Confederation, one of the many cells in the PRI. A come bearing guest for the planting season, he gesticulated as the truck drivers placed wooden crates on the roadside. Their weight caused them to sink into the ground below. They read pineapple seeds. You can't leave this here. There's a warehouse up the road you can deliver it to. One of the peasants stood up and inspected the first crate of the glow growing stack of identical boxes. Pineapples? We have no idea how to grow pineapples. You can learn. The bureaucrat motioned for the unloading to continue, but we'll provide info on how to grow them properly shortly. But I recommend planting them as soon as possible. I hear that pineapples have a long gestation period. I hope to get you in your truck only before I give you something to digest it, you vowed hog. The farmer yelled, chasing the bureaucrat back to his truck. The CNC is supposed to work for us, not the other way around. Passing up our concerns, not handing down orders. Farmers plant seeds they do not choose for profits they would not see. Whatever. In 26 days? Well, third aftermath? Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah, no, this is this has gone on for too long. Seriously. If we did the other way, I mean, come on. It should be easier than this. This is, like I guess this is an, this is honestly just annoying at this point. Just annoying. Blowback. As a heavy rain fell across Mexico City, Carlos Madraza looked out at his office window inside. After his speech in Yalisco, the party joined ranks against him. Many once begged to meet with him were now refusing his calls, and his enemies smelled blood in the water. It slowly dawned on him that there was no coming back from this. Meanwhile, at Los Pinos, President Ordaz barely noticed the rain. Um, men who uh, blah, blah, blah. His eyes were glued to the transcript of Madrazo's recent speech. As he read further his grip on the paper titan, his eyes bulged and sweat rolled down his face. Madrazo had always been a hothead, but this was completely unacceptable. Ordaz thought back to the Aleutian crisis, and how? He derailed negotiations by playing into the U.S.'s hands. That one mistake, one momentary lapse in judgment, had nearly destroyed his relationship with Lopez Mateos, and now here he was, faced with a subordinate who constantly exercised poor judgment, defied the president's orders, and threatened the stability of the nation. How could he place his trust in a man like that? He couldn't, with the realization that came clarity. His anxiety faded along with any remaining faith in Madrazo. Sitting down the transcript, Ordaz picked up the phone. Lesson, Seattle, Laurel Ortega, this is the president. Please meet me in my office immediately. The last piece falls into place. Um, truth be told, this makes more sense for us to go with the Americans. Uh, even though it would make sense to get more Japanese influence. We go with this one. But we've already, we're so harshly, tightly wound up with the Americans. It seems like it, it would make more sense to go with this. Also with this one, American contracts. We don't trust imperialist Japanese regime as far as we can throw it. This is known. Accordingly, we would not therefore be unwise to risk a project to the scale by putting it in the hands of untrustworthy countries. Let us not try to risk anything by engaging in the sort of adventurism of the Salinas' foolish technocrats would partake in. It's Americans we should rely on. Phrases such as good old American know-how and ingenuity are not and never have been hollow. Their expertise and diligence will be far more than sufficient for our needs. Elevator pitch. Uh, preciado. You had a proposal for us, President Ordaz said, tapping the thick manila of, uh, envelope or folder in front of him. Yes, sir. Secretary of Agriculture and Animal Husbandry, Juan Gil Preciado, stood to speak to the president and the rest of the assembled secretaries. It had been a lengthy cabinet meeting. Rich man had fought for the president's attention and hopefully his support. Now it's Preciado's turn. Located within the folders in front of you is a comprehensive plan to address the difficulties currently facing our rural population. He quickly glanced at the man and lazily opened their identical folders. So far, this administration has made many great strides in industrialization, but I fear our progress in that regard has blinded us to the people of the countryside. With some key investment and a renewed focus on agriculture, I believe we can reverse many of the persistent troubles our large rural population faces. Mm -hmm. Very good, Preciado, or Daz said before the secretary could continue. He opened the first page of the pile and skimmed it. Of course, or Daz already read the program's key proposals. He, uh, when it allows such an extensive government program to be presented to his cabinet without at least want some prior approval, uh, whether the pre Preciado knew it or not, I appreciate the hard work you and your team have put in the matter. Ordaz closed the folder, ending his consideration. The rest of the men followed suit with a wave of folding paper. I will leave this with my team and will decide whether or not to implement it as written. Ordaz concluded the topic by handing the papers off to a nearby system. Preciado remained standing. All eyes were on him. Despite all the notes and data he had labored to prepare for this meeting, the discussion was now closed. All I could muster was a thank you, sir, before sitting again. The peasants can solve their own problems. If there's a fourth strike, I'm done, man. I am straight up done. This has just gone on too long. Um, loyalty would decrease enough. I don't want that one. Honestly, I don't think we need to do too much here to get more three more, but up to twenty, so we should be okay. Should be. God, I hope so. Just desserts. To the licenciado Raúl Salinas Lozano, our Daz's pen practically flew across the page. His mouth twisted into a vicious smile. He'd been waiting for this moment for a long, long time. And that of your many years of service, it is my pleasure to announce your assignment. 
Since the inauguration, Lopez Mateo has been urging Ordaz to be magnanimous towards Salinas. The man's a talented economist, he said over and over. I know it won't be in your cabinet, but you should keep him around in some capacity. As a special advisor to the governor of Yucatan, effective immediately. Ordaz felt otherwise. For years, Salinas had sabotaged him, slandered him, and tried to steal the presidency out from under him. Such a man could not be allowed to hold power in any real power. Every day he spent in the capital made Ordaz a stomach churn and burn. Good luck and safe travels, President Gustavo Diaz Ordaz. As he picked up the finished letter, Ordaz nearly let a roar of triumph. A snake would be banished at last. Salinas and its technocrats were finished. Their scheme is broken forever. Woe to the vanquished. Oh, and there goes uh, that. Oh, look, look at all that political power we get from all this stuff now. You know, I'm not even going to choose to do anything yet because we have to see what type of other garbage we have to do with here. Bowing out, Rodrigo Salinas Lozano sat in his office uh, alone, working late in the evening. He looked around at the room's expensive furnishings, felt the soft leather of his chair and the finish of the uh, hardwood desk. In front of him, spoiling the mood was a letter from President Ordaz. This new assignment was ridiculous. Did Ordaz seriously expect him to give up his life in the capital for some mud hut in the Yucatan just because he had been ordered to? If so, the new president was far duller than he'd ever imagined. He opened his desk and pulled out a few new document, an application for a professorship at UNAM, one of the many universities that would be eager to add him to their faculty. Going back to academia was never part of the plan, but with Ordaz trying to send him into exile was the best option available. And he reminded himself, most likely a temporary setback. After Ordaz's success in there would be other presidents, men who didn't just bury their heads in the sand, and men with no who with vision who would seek Salinas's counsel. He might even have another shot at the presidency. Father asked his eldest son, Raúl, "Carlos and I are going to the movies. Would you like to join us?" "No, thank you. I'm a bit busy at the moment. Have a good time." As his son turned to leave, Salinas's thoughts drifted towards another possibility. Even if he never managed to achieve his grand ambitions, he might be able to mold the next generation of leaders. May they succeed where I failed. Mateos' dream. More political power. Building slots. Practical realities. Well, if you're going to do this, please go ahead, because we're going to go with Mateos' dream. President Lopez Mateos poured blood, sweat, and tears in securing the Mexican bid for the Olympics. Aside from strengthening the prosperity of the Mexican people and preserving the welfare of the institutional revolution, the Olympic bid was his greatest work and the one in which he most took the most pride in. It was Lopez Mateos' dream to accomplish a successful Olympics in this country. What pulled that dream? For all that he had done for Mexico, for the party, for the president, or does, personally, we owe him that much, at least. Also take over. Fukuda. We leisurely walked down the avenue on his way back to work. After lunch, the route to and from from his favorite cafe led directly past an enormous construction site. It would eventually become one of the avenues of the Olympic Games. Over the course of the past year, he had seen to it from a brazen or barren field of churned earth to something halfway recognizing as a stadium. Today was an especially busy day. A fleet of long-nosed semi-trucks idled on the street. Their flatbed trailers carried a huge tracked cranes. An American foreman barked orders to the operators as they were unloaded one by one. Fukuda <laughs> furrowed his brow. Friends in the construction sector said that it was a real struggle to get contracts renewed. When it came to the Olympics, the situation was even worse. Every new venue would be built by American engineers with American equipment. No matter how low the Japanese firms went, all they would get in response were blunt rejection letters. Just two years ago, Japan's place as a backer of the Mexican miracle seemed unimpeachable. unimpeachable. But now it was an open secret that even the Zaibotsu youths were considering downsides in their Mexican branches. Fukuda tried not to think too hard about what this implied for the future of his career here. How long would it be until Japan was removed from Mexico permanently? I'm not touching that. Uh, failed? What do you mean failed? Hmm. Envy of the world. The games of the 19th Olympiad will be the symbol of the United Mexican States showing Mexican culture, industry, and innovation to the broader world. Only fool be, would deny the existence of the untold profits available to us with this opportunity. The money and prestige can grow out of the five rings in a way we wish it would on trees. Exploring the image conveyed by the Olympics will endeavor to attract as much investment as possible. Well, we'll see. Oh my god. A fourth strike. Are you kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? Why? I should have killed everybody. I'm sorry. By this point, I'm sick of this. I absolutely should have just killed them all. It doesn't even matter now. What I, I can say whatever since I've been demonetized on YouTube anyway, so... Um, when selected, decrease by 5. And removed, a further decrease by 5. That sounds like a pretty good one to do. That's why I kept the political power, because we're just getting screwed in the back really hard. With all this stuff here. And I, telephone, and electricity services. They deserve nothing. They deserve to rot in a cell, in my opinion, at this point. Is it still 18 for this, or? So then, no, it needs to be zero. Okay, so we really need to crush them hard. Um, active for 28 days. Well, well then what's the point? 
The fourth strike. Oh, because there might be aftermath too. I should have just kill them all. Um, so we have to do that one anyways. Uh, I think I want to do this one next. Occupy the hospitals. Malingering. A summer draws to an end. Parents across Mexico prepare to send their children back to school. And those pinos, the president and first lady were doing much the same. Ordaz set the reading the morning paper while Guadalupe nursed a cup of coffee. At, their, at last, her youngest son, Alfredo, appeared. Good morning, son. Ready for your first day? Ordaz asked. Lowering his paper, why aren't you wearing your uniform? The 15-year-old boy shifted awkwardly in his pajamas. I'm feeling sick, he replied, adding some cops for effect. I don't think I can make it to school today. Ordaz frowned but said nothing, shooting his wife a stern look as to say, handle this. He got up and left for work. Alfredo Guadalupe said in a sweet tone, I know you're nervous, but there's no reason to be upset. The National Preparatory School is a great institution. I'm sure I'll have a good time. My mom's serious, he said, looking down, I really don't feel well. Knowing this argument would lead nowhere, Guadalupe decided to switch tactics. Well, that's a shame. I was thinking you deserve a reward after your first day, maybe a trip to the go-kart track you like so much, but if you're really sick, I guess you, just, you can stay home. Alfredo's demeanor shifted at the mention of go-karts, letting out a deep sigh, met his mother's eyes and said, fine, I'll go to school. Not every child aspires to greatness. Ain't that the truth. So let's wait and do that one too. Envy of the world. The price of prestige. Hurry up, we're going to be late, Isabel said to Oscar as they ran through U UNAM's University City Campus. Of course, her aging civics professor picked the evening of the Pumas game to hold the class late to finish his lecture. They sprinted across Los, Las Islas, past the towering Central Library and its Aztec-inspired murals, and across the street to the stadium. What the heck? Isabel slowed to a stop. <clears throat> Oscar arrived a moment later, grasping for breath. A huge crowd of spectators were loitering around the stadium. No one was being let inside. The two friends approached another student to find out what was going on. Um, they moved the darn gates of the game across town, a young man fumed. Why? Uh, Oscar asked. They're renovating the stadium. They wanted to tear out the whole field to put in a tartan trap. The American athletes were throwing a fit about us not having one. It was all over the news last week, but I don't think they'd bend over for them that easily. The young man grumbled more than does his BS, I'm sure. Isabel and Oscar joined the rest of the crowd in their march to the other stadium. So we really want to lower intern radicalism. Intern. That's interesting. Five. That's not bad. Five for both. Yeah, that's not worth it as much. This one's good to do. Yeah, no, this is such a waste. The Milk Order Compo Report. A quantitative beauty lies in front of the President's eyes. A chart projected under the entire wall. Detailing the inner workings of Indo-Pacific trade. Imports and export volumes. Tariffs and information. The kinds of goods traded. Piracy locations along with numbers abound. The president's eyes were drawn in a new edition on the center right side, however, a middle-eyes top of the name of Melchor El Campo. As you can see, Your Excellency, the growth targets for a new port have been met. The industry and commerce official drew his guest's attention towards the number on the right side of the screen. Had they been exceeded? No. It's faced a stiff competition from other ports in the region, particularly from the established American ports in the region, like on the west coast and from the U.S. allies in the Pacific. Our? The official tiptoes around his words. Uh, our cautionary, cautionary tariffs are proving to be a roadblock to further foreign investment. The Secretary of Industry and Commerce is already prepared a proposal you may have a look. The President takes the document, a large page of jargon with a summary on top. A free port status, where they reduce customs and trade barriers with a projected market share increasing of double digit. The President stops reading and realizes what this proposal will do. Wouldn't this get rid of some of our guarantees for our domestic industry? Your Excellency, things can come at a cost. Go ahead, we need the investment. We cannot afford to undermine our development strategy. Our new source of income will open in Yucatan, totaling $200 million. Um, I like the base simulation. Sphere influence will largely increase. I don't know that much. Oh, oh, never mind. We got quite a bit of loyalty. 100 already? Holy cow. 100? Alright, we're going to take it. Will it decrease? We lost 15. But we can take the hit. So we're okay with that. Use last resort. So stupid. A dimming light. Mild concessions. Eh. Showcase good doctors. We actually might need this too, maybe. In 21 days. Um. Yeah, this, at this point, the, the game is... The, this stuff is just set up to screw us over anyway, so... Uh, Secretary Campos Salas, Lopez Mateo said, looking up from the map in front of him. Do what do, what do I owe the pleasure? Uh, Campos Salas smiled nervously. Apologies, Your Excellency. I was in the neighborhood and I wanted to check on the Olympic Committee's work. I just hope I'm not intruding. <coughs> just Adolfo's fun. There's no trouble at all. Please have a seat. 
Mateo's returned his gaze to the map. Right now, I'm drawing up a preliminary plan for the path of the Olympic torch relay. I'm thinking of having it pass through the city's historic center. Campo Salas's eyes lit up. It should pass by industrial parks as well. Mateo's froze, horrified by the image of the Olympic torch illuminating dull smokestacks and shoddy tenements. May I ask why? If you place Mexico's industry front and center, the world will know we're open for business. It's a perfect way to attract foreign investment. As Mateo sort of a polite way to refuse his advice, he realized something. Salinas would never have suggested something so daft. The old Secretary of Industry and Commerce was smarter than this. He had the former president had no one to blame but himself. He had made Ordaz a successor, knowing his personality might lead him to choose loyal underlings over brilliant ones. He only hoped these men had to take what to preserve the nation's prosperity. Are they ready for the challenges ahead? An orderly start. There is a good mood in the government these days. The year has been good so far. The informa de Goberino went well. The institutional revolutionary parties are united behind us. Kind of. Stocks are slow, the press is square, and the middle class is prepared to accept the next period of a ripe rule. Yes, there may be no doubt at this juncture. We are on our way. Stability and prosperity await the United Mexican States under the guidance of President Diaz Ordaz. <coughs> Democracy is respected for a person's way of life, integrity, and dignity, their liberty, and individual conscience. Who dares wins? <coughs> Arturo wished he still had access to a blackboard as a cadre huddled around the plans. How are the children of Dolores doing anyway? One less Cadillo, but one less teacher too. He hoped the sacrifice would be worth it, but worrying about it was pointless now. He'd made his choice, and now it's time to act upon it. Comrades, gentlemen, he began. I can't say it has been fun playing at the El Chuco El Roto these past few months, but at the same time, it's come for great deeds. The armies may be deployed against us, but little word is spread outside the hills of the Sierra Madre. How can we emulate the successes of the 26th of the July movement if we have no 26th of July of our own? Fortunately, we have found the perfect target for such an operation. In seven days' time, the barracks of Madero shall be our own Moncada, and Sierra Madre shall soon be our Sierra Mastra. Some of the girls cheer, but many others remain silent. But comrade, how are we going to fight as a whole garrison? The state's already crawling with soldiers as is, and sure, Moncada was a propaganda victory eventually, but Castro failed to take the barracks, and 60 rebels died, more than the amount of people we have in total. Arturo Smato was hoping you asked me that. You see, Castro's mistake was that he started the Peasants' War after the raid, where we've done the reverse. As our army friends are a little too busy looking for us to guard their own turf, a little birdie told me that they have only have a skeleton crew left inside, them and a ton of useful weapons and equipment. Don't worry, comrade, I'm not sending us off to die. Now who's with me? All the men cheered. Toolkit. The rifles they took first and the hard hats of the countless soldiers. Firing, hurting Jesus Fernandez Chacon and his GPG column into the one-room house of Sunbleach Wood. The grenade, a single one, vanguard of its kind. Flying through the open window, spraying shrapnel and splinters through their bodies, and the Fernandez's side. The wound burned with pain as his arms rose and surrendered. The Pelliers, the grinning DFS man, held them up to the Fernandez's face. Asked where the other columns were, ripped off a fingernail, and asked where Arturo Gamis was, and ripped off. The hammer displayed a Fernandez in loving detail, slammed down on the small stove's bone became powder. Where was Gamis? Slam. Where was Gaetan? Slam. The rope. After the smell of blood filled the air, after the words gurgled from Fernandez's mouth, they brought out the rope. Hanged him and the other girls from the roof of the little house. The sign, the government had arrived. Good. And, uh, being adjourned. Postmortem. The president and his cabinet sat around a table in dead silence. The triumphant attitude of the administration's early days was long gone and replaced with tension and regret. They needed to discuss something, the only thing worth discussing at the moment, but none of them could bring themselves to speak after seeing Ordaz's face. Your Excellency, Man Manal too, began summoning his courage. He slowly produced a copy of the New York Times, as cover showing police officers beating a doctor to a bloody pulp. Pictures like these are doing real damage to a reputation abroad. With the Olympics coming up, perhaps more discretion would be wise. Ordaz fixed his deathly glare on Manatao. These subversives were being influenced by foreign backers. They should see how we deal with traitors in Mexico. Manautu immediately climbed up. The rest of the cabinet remained frozen, unsure of how to respond. After another long silence, Del Rosal rose to confront Ordaz, Your Excellency. I believe this crackdown has been a misstep. I understand the reasoning behind it, and if it were carried out in the early stages of the strikes, it probably would have succeeded. But the doctors have garnered national attention and significant public support. It'll take some time to do, undo the damage. As the general hoped this diplomatic tone would soften the blow, he was mistaken. Ordaz see his rage intensifying the sharp pain in his stomach. Anger and shame contorted his ugly face in a truly horrifying visage. Now glowering at Del Rosal, Ordaz opened his mouth and spoke two words, meaning adjourn. Been forced to crack down the AMM and the AMMRI, while still considerable public opinion influence. B.S. The units may have been disbanded, but it was not worth the cost. That's so stupid. Are you fucking kidding me? I... Pff. Are you fucking kidding me? With all this crap that we had to do with this? Wow, this... This does not leave a good taste in my mouth. Jesus Christ. The raid on Madeira Barracks. The 1700... September 22nd. We'll meet you at the barracks. Column 2 and 3 will cut off any reinforcements of the rail line and be available for opportunistic attacks on the rear during your assault. 
uh, from uh, Arturo, El Salvador, get done. During the stream, but there's no turning back. Pablo, Salvador, and Jacobo will get in the columns of the barracks. Storm or no storm. We'll keep marching and attack on schedule. They'll be there. Arturo Gamis. On the 23rd. Uh, surrender, you're surrounded. Surrender. Arturo Gamis, column 1, initiating the attack. Get to the rail line. Get to the rail and get down. There's a whole battalion in there. There by the rail, trains got them lit up. There's only 15 other GPG guys. Open fire. And the Gomi, get the heck off me. Arturo's down there. We can't. From Jacobo Gamis. No, 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 we can't. All you do is give the governor another corpse to parade around. Your brother's dead. My brother's dead. We can keep the revolution they fought for alive. But if you die here today, but not but not if you die today, column two retreat. That says Salvador Gaetan. I'll take half the column and regroup with column three. Saw them fleeing west. Other half can pick up the reinforcements in Cibadilla, then head south. Make for the Durango border. Can you lead them, Jacobo? For our thrill's sake, I have to. Are you kidding me? Why? An early start. Attack on Madeira Barracks. Oh my god. Well, time to kill everybody. I'm sick of this. Early yesterday, a column of the insurgent Grupo Popular Guerrero, or GPG, assaulted the army barracks near Sierra, Ciudad Madera, Chihuahua. <clears throat> the soldiers with them bravely fought back, resulting in complete victory with very limited casualties for the army. All the attackers, including the terrorist leader Arturo Gamis, were killed in the fighting. The DFS and the Secretary of Defense have announced a joint operation to bring the other cells of the GPG to justice. One attack on a federal base is unprecedented since the Cristero War. Uh, the citizens of Mexico can rest assured that a government will stop these bloodthirsty communists from terrorizing our nation. Oh. September 23rd, 1965, a date to remember. A matter of uh, honor. Are we meant to sit around and tolerate this? The raid on the Sierra bar Barracks is nothing less than a humiliation. The first attack on Federal Army Base since the end of the Cristero War. This cannot be permitted to continue. There is nothing less than an insult against the honor of the President of the Republic himself. The raid is a gauntlet thrown in Ordaz's face. This cannot be borne. This, this, this will not be borne. Let the Mexican people be our witness. Treason and rebellion will be crushed. The law must be enforced at all costs. Anarchy not, cannot and will not be permitted. The dirty war's begun. Okay, so we might have another one after this. So, with this stuff, I'm done with you. I'm so fucking done with this. It's not funny. Um, you know, I tried to negotiate with them early on, and they said nothing. So, next time we do this, if I do this again, I'm going to kill them off as fast and early as I can. Broken apart. The judge's t papery skin stretched sickeningly over his gaunt face as he spoke. It seemed that at any moment it would be slot off to reveal his true form. A smiling devil that delighted in torment? No, Lupita had never seen any expression on the old guy's face other than a stern glare. The creature on the bench, staring down at her, was not one capable of empathy or any emotion other than paternal or fury. Oh, good, it destroyed her political power too. You and your accomplices have spent months conducting inflammatory demonstrations, disturbing public order, and attempting to spread your insurgent labor movement across the nation. For the crime of social dissolution, you'll be sentenced to six years in prison. The order on Lupita receded away from her. It felt like she was watching the courtroom through binoculars from somewhere in the back of her skull. She wanted to scream or cry or do something, anything. No noise escaped her mouth. She blinked back tears. Cameras flashed as policemen uh, approached the defendant's table. Anger surged in the gallery. The judge slammed the gavel on the bench. The only sound left were the sobs from her parents. The policeman shepherded Lupita out of the room. Tears fell from her face, staining the carpet as she left. Uh, well, we're going to really get a lot of imperiousness, aren't we? Discipline's virtue. Now it is the human nature to be born with a fondness for profit, indulging this leads to contention and strife for the sense of modesty and yielding with which one was born disappears. One is born with feelings of envy and hate, and by indulging these one is led into banditry and theft so that the sense of loyalty and good faith with which he was born disappears. Public protests in today's Mexico are done by the disloyal, those who indulge in contention, and envy for their own pleasure. Rather than working for the benefit of Mexico, these fools and traitors are content to attack it. Worse yet, they draw inspiration from the so-called martyrs of the GPG, well, for them, no further tolerance. Legal punishments for those shirts immediately will be increased. Retaliation. I love that we can't do anything. And we have death crisis, too. Are you kidding me? It seems like this is just coming all undone now at this point. This maybe was not worth doing. So, yeah. So what happens if we have a death crisis? Retaliation. Diaz or Diaz's hands never shook so violently while writing a legal document. It was 3 a.m., but he had yet to leave the presidential office. A person that commits a crime of social disillusion will be sent to a term of at least five years and will really be released disenfranchised or be released disenfranchised for at least one year. The pencil fell to the table. Humiliation and anger suffused him. Just thinking about these guerrilla scum enraged him beyond belief. He could not even mention their acronym without feeling the strongest impulse towards blind rage he had ever felt. These communist scum, how could they have escaped his notice as Secretary of the Interior? He had connections to the DFS. How they screwed up like this? What sort of, sort of incompetence have it taken place on his watch that this could have happened? Who was to blame? Who? And how did they dare to humiliate him after he became president? Detract from his rightful rule, his governance over the Mexican state, in a so brazen of a manner? They could only have led outside assistance. 
Well, what subhuman did it? How did they do it? Who was responsible? Who, who, who? The prisoner's brain was rolling under the pressure of exhaustion and paranoia. Though th through the word, uh, though the word who and associated with wild flights of thought had overwhelmed his stream of consciousness, he still scratched out his work and rewrote the draft, harsher this time. A person that commits a crime of social dissolution will be sentenced to a term of at least 10 years and will really be released on and be disenfranchised for at least 10 years. They depart further and further from getting under control and think they're right not to stop. It's bedtime. Our work was clearly insufficient. The doctors were sent back to their hospitals, but their treason emboldened other groups of protesters. Now the universities are empty as their students go out and engage in the exact same sort of protest that medics did before them. They attempted to form student unions and negotiate with the universities and the government on how preposterous it is. By decree of the government and by a directive to the Ministry of Education, the attempts by subversives to disabled Mexican educational institutions by engaging in anti government activities must be strangled. Curfews and protest bans will be mandated. To enforce those protections, police and grenadiers will be deployed as well as, as was done in the hospitals. Will not see any pressure that's illegal or inconvenient. So we're we're screwed out of all this. Great, thank you so much. Uh, resolution of peasant subversion in Chihuahua. Uh, pursuant to the directions led by the executive power and DFS leadership, we have worked with the state police forces in the state of Chihuahua to restore order and stability in the aftermath of the raid by communist subversives on the Madera Army Barrack. Most recently, we retook control of the Sabadilla area in the aftermath of a concurrent occupation of the region by communists. The communists, having long since departed after massacring the local landowners and their families, we found mainly peasants that colluded with them. These peasants, in a long shot attempt to hide their subversion and have, one and all, said they had merely joined with the communist rebels in order to burn the records of unjustly excessive deaths they claimed to have owed to the local Kakikus. Applying physical force liberally where needed, we have taken these peasant subversives into custody and are currently interrogating them in the Chihuahua Police Headquarters and then the DFS offices in the region. We'll provide updates on any pertinent information that comes up, very respectfully. Command of the DFS office in Chihuahua, Colonel Simeon Anzotegui Dominguez, forward to the president immediately, please. It's bedtime and restrict the reformists. Though Gauls are governed in a minute, and it hurts or does to think of it, we must face facts. The CEM presidency of Carlos Madrazo is developed in a manner not necessarily to our advantage. Ha! That man goes further than we wanted him to, and does not pay heed to our requests. We have to thwart his uh, chaotic projects, lest the continued survival of the Institutional Revolutionary Party be called into question. These anti-corruption efforts of Madrazo's, they have to be contained. Nothing is wrong with them in principle. The issue is that we, they are collapsing the PRI. What sort of successful anti-corruption measure involves picking fights with governors and anything that moves as a pulse and wears a PRI pin? Who holds primary so chaotic as to make a flower war look peaceful? Madrazo needs to move on from the CEN. Before he goes so far, he'll even regret it. Escalation. Uh, peasant violence in Chiapas. Recent reports have been brought to us that anti kkq protests by peasants in the state of Chiapas has gone violent. The most recent manifestation of this form of dissension took the form of an attack on a particularly hated Kakakyu's plantation. After repeated apparent conflicts between the Kakakyu and Senate, this property was looted and then torched. The majority of our information on the situation is not up to DFS standards. We can only certifi certifiably confirm that the Kakakyu's property was attacked and burned down, and that his workers suffered numerous injuries. The Kakakyu is now obsessively insisting that there is a threat of socialist revolt in the area, but we are still unclear on what precisely motivated the peasants to act. We have already arrested some of the ringleaders of the specific incident that has been described above, and are keeping a close eye on the broader situation in order to ensure the preservation of order. However, since we have only the unreliable words of the Kakakyu as proof of any incipient socialist insurgency in the state, the state of siege may be questionable at this stage. Despite this assessment, the suppression of insurrectionism in all its forms require our, and remains our highest priority. We await instructions of the next course of action. For the President immediately, Colonel, we'll take no chances. The army will be sent in. Even the appearance of peasant subversion must be eliminated. The walls are falling in. Stenography, professional note-taking, uh, shorthand writing, layouts of keyboards, decoding hand, shorthand, secretarial etiquette. Day in and day out of the secretarial course would continue. It was not onerous, but it was surely tedious. One night too much was consuming. Uh, was consumed. Camilla watched in dismay as the last bus from the university to her home drove away. She'd have to walk home. Uh, Dad's going to lose his mind at me for missing that curfew of his if I don't end up getting mugged on the way back, she thought. Ooh, look at this. Eh, more loyalty is always nice. Um, what actually happened was no less fortunate than a mugging. But notice to her, the federal district had imposed a new citywide curfew on its own. Stopping her for violating the curfew, the duty officer was met with Camille's law disagreement. Can't you see I'm just a law-abiding student heading home from the studies? What sort of nonsense is this? Randomly detaining people. The argument carried on and on, at last the officer slammed his truncheon on the wall of the building next to her head. Besides, I've had enough lip from you, ma'am. You're under arrest for violating the curfew. Count yourself lucky you'll only be in the slammer for the night. Keep talking and we'll extend the sentence. 
A, a gelid look of horror, which is a unique word, I've not seen it before, gelid, uh, took hold on Camilla's face and did not leave for the next several hours. Her head had already been whirling from fatigue, but now fear joined it. Dragged away to prison and thrown into a holding cell for the night, all Camilla could ask herself before her lack of energy at last knocked her out was, how could have this had happened? Because other people didn't care about the success of everyone else. Neglect Ejitos. We're still building them. And then getting her hands dirty. Trees and proliferate so that we're confronted with what the old sage calls terror on every side. Resistance to our rightful rule until the governance of the institutional revolutionary party is rising. Our initial efforts have clearly been insufficient. The political situation is changing too fast for our liking and yet it may spiral out of our control. Uh, we must get our hands dirty now. Uh, or dirtier. Kick them in mud and blood and secure the features of Mexico and its president. We must grind our enemies into nothingness to secure a bit of tomorrow, lest we face untold hordes of the vicious vicious and victorious hands. We can no longer allow the impermissible breaking of the legal order. Embrace new methods to achieve victory in the dirty war. My god, how long is this going on? Why did our our deficient ad admin systems well, our balance is destroying us? Well, I mean, I'll be honest. This has turned out to be a campaign maybe which I didn't even start because this is not turning out to be very good for us. So, I don't know. I might regret doing this campaign. But we'll see it to the end. A failed shepherd's at repentance. With every strike of the pen, a horde scream would respond in echo falling gunfire. It followed him through every execution of his joints. The screams, the explosions, the dread and anger, Lopez Mateos would crumple his letter to, to the president and move to draft another one. Lopez Mateos was never present, yet the lingering melancholy persisted. A tragedy was at his hands, the Sierra Barracks raid, an attack on Mexico and her people. This was a recalling the useful career, hiding from the armed Cristeros, cursing them for the betrayal. Back then he hid, daring not to speak in fear and cowardice. Maybe since he's then refusing to act directly influenced the most recent insurgency. Also would have been avoided, surely, if his words were closely decorated enough to coerce the insurgents. But alas, violence cracked throughout Mexico, violence, had had, violence his hands failed to prevent. He sniffed in his heavy hand, or head, met with sweaty palms, the pen now discarded rolled across the desk, mocking the dwindling confidence of Lopez Mateos. The only response that seemed that he could muster was a single groan, but nothing could be placed on a paper. He lifted his head, now staring outside his window, as eyes lost in the never-ending skies of the Mexican night. It was his fault. The skies are dark, and it was his fault. The strikes eliminated. It'll last until a year from now. You know, I think this is just a bit too harsh, in all honesty. Like, we try to negotiate with them early on. Help them out. But, my God. And we did nothing but revolutionary agriculture, too. Hmm. Oh, well. It was last right. It all seemed well for Lopez Mateos, despite the adversities that Mexico has faced in the past weeks. He can endure. Or that, too, is what he told himself. Something that lingered on for far too long. A pain so undefeatable. That dread of migraine, a pain that has disturbed the posture of Lopez Mateos' work ethic, had summoned itself again. A tender blade pierced through his skull, releasing thousands and thousands of dancing fireworks that numbed his frame. The pain this invisible enemy, who hated Lopez Mateos so dearly, seemed to retreat his eyelids in the rear of his head. His vision slipped, barely within the confines of his grip. Confused and dazed, now with a milling creature scurrying in front of his eyes, Lopez Mateos ejected himself from his seat and sprang into the air. His mouth opened for a breath, but his own lungs locked themselves into opposition. Suddenly, he would stagger forwards, saving himself by, from falling by clinging onto the frame of his desk. He could not hear the pencils and lamp crashing on the floor, nor could he hear himself gasp for assistance. He released words with no meaning, with no sense, with no clarity. He turned his head to the left and saw a blurring crowd approaching. Lopez's, uh, Lopez Mateos bit his lip as by responding to the shivering winds. The speaker's silence and the crowd disappeared. The light that the Lord had offered began to escape in sheath. The diligent saber of Lopez Mateos finally put to rest as the world faded to black and the persisting screams finally ended. The candle wick is almost burned up and gulped by smoke. Well, crap, that's not good. Parting words. The last few months, I'd taken the toll on Carlos Madrazo. His face sagged, his eyes were bloodshed, and a feeling of resignation had overtaken him. He still believed in the reformist cause, but he could no longer lead it. It was time for his last act of the president of the PRI. That's in Seattle, Madrazo, or Dasa had come in. The president's tone was cold and dispassionate. Madrazo thought back to the partnership during the sexenio of Lopez Mateos when he had considered Ordaz a friend. Clearly that time had come to an end. Your Excellency, as president of the National Executive Committee, I have always done what I thought was best for the PRI. I realize now that I no longer hold the confidence of the party, or your confidence. In the interest of stability, I would like to offer my resignation. Ordaz's stern expression didn't change. Your resignation is accepted. You may leave. You need to choose someone to take my place, Madrazo said quickly. I have a list of candidates I think it would work. That will not be necessary. I've already ever a replacement of mine. Madrazo silently cursed his luck. The president was certain to pick a man who would undo all his reforms. Well, not just his. Lord, I'll take it fought for reform, says fiercely. He made a mental note to apologize to his longtime partner. Is there something else you wish to discuss, or does asked harshly? No, goodbye. Your Excellency, have a good night. La Gunya del Desertio Incident. I don't know. It's all, we're all having a terrible time here, apparently. 
at least less we expect. <coughs> your results, the doctor said. They're, they're, we've located seven cerebral aneurysms within your brain. Less in Seattle, your symptoms are manageable as long as you limit your stress and interrupting his speech. Lopez Mateo slowly raised his hand, lifting it from the railing of the hospital bed and touched the shoulder of the doctor. How long until I perish, he asked solemnly. The doctor lowered his head into his chest and held onto the cold hand of Lopez Mateo's. With much hesitation, he spoke. I fear you will not survive past the current decade. It was like a sincere burst of thunder, launched directly at his chest. Had He had not had the power to cry, but to appreciate the history of his life up to this point. Determined for the future, he lifted his hand and gave a slight smile. Everything in my lap up to this point has smiled to me, Lopez Mateos responded. It's about time I had to pay back. I thought he had already died. But at least he's still here, that's good. Hey, maybe we'll get better industrial base, maybe. Something positive out of this, please. The replacement. Carlos Madrazo sat at home, absentmindedly watching TV. He wasn't enjoying, any, enjoying his earlier retirement from politics, but would have to get used to it. There's no longer any place for him in government. For all of his and Ortega's reformist zeal, they have been able to defeat the schemes of the old guard. On the TV, President Ordaz, his voice as emotionless as ever, was speaking at a press conference. With license out of Madrazo's resignation, the PRI will need a new leader shepherd to enter the future. Madrazo grimaced, bracing himself for the name of the successor. And there's no man more qualified than Licenciado Loro Ortega. What? He can't believe his eyes as Ortega emerged from a crowd of smug party members, took Ordaz's place at the podium, and announced a complete repeal of all the reforms. Wow. As he recovered from his shock, he finally started pulling the pieces together. Ah. How long had his old friend been scheming to replace him? Smart. How many of Ortega's suggestions had been traps designed to blow up in his face? Had Ordaz really been on him? He looked at the president's cold, uncaring eyes and figured he must have been. Madrazo fiercely shut off the TV after 30 years of loyal service to the PRI. He even stabbed in the back and tossed aside. And those guys thought they could get rid of him so easily they had another thing coming. It would make their whole Ron party pay, moving to his desk, he pulled out a pen, and prepared to resign his PRI membership. Yeah, beer care loads will increase. It's all a corrosion, though. Oh, that's not good. That's quite not good. So, um, sorry, I clicked on something else I didn't mean to. Well, this is back up to 100. This, that's good. Give you the command power earlier. Yeah, 50%, that's good. A harrowing revelation. Ordaz patiently sat next to Lopez Mateo, holding his cold and tender hand. In a rare moment of sympathy, Ordaz felt shaken when receiving the news of Lopez Mateo's diagnosis. They say I shall not live for many years following this one, Lopez Mateo's friend. I must solemnly report. Every depressing word that he spoke sent shockwaves down the spine of Ordaz. The world was a grimacing place, and Lopez Mateos had been one of the few soothing hands to reach out to him. With the sun setting behind him, their hearts fell together, whispering, his last friend and last protection destroyed. Politics are rough, I'm sure you're aware, and I fear that I must remove myself from that world. Ordaz responded calmly, I understand. I really do. Promise me that you'll regularly notify me of a condition as the days go on. Of course, Ordaz, of course. They both smiled. It was a little reassuring, but Ordaz still felt lonely. Abandoned. Politics are rough, that is sure, and it seems that around every corner of this opposition, one by one, those who Ordaz held dear dearly disappear. This star shine no longer. And we have restraint. We've got all sorts of things. I hate this. Like, we had we had to choose temp tax guys because the game literally does not give us enough political power. So we destroyed how much political power we can get for a momentary time. Oh, man. Yeah, it teaches me a lesson never play Mexico. Madeira's Martyrs. On the September 22nd, the flash of recognition and the young man's eyes would have brought Salvatore Gaetan's sidearm to his temple. Only Kakakyu thugs, federal soldiers, and the darn DFS knew his face and knew his name. Now his was crumpling to his feet, begging to accompany the former GPG commander's ragged band. He said he was ready to give his life for the new revolution, as Arturo Gomez had at Madeira, to overthrow the landowners and the party brutal liars, and to break the Haciendas apart so that, at last, real Mexicans could take their promised land. Socialism, Cuba, and all the right sounds poured from his mouth between gasping breaths and tears. All Gaetan said in response was, Do you have a gun? Asked an unarmed Jacobo Gomez, hundreds of kilometers south. His listener, the wizened old man whose cramped kitchen this was, nodded and limped to the adjoining bedroom. Moments later, he returned, proffering an ancient but proudly polished Mauser. Jacobo began to thank him, but the veteran waved his hand. It's from Torriani, he explained, and it's yours now. Finish what we couldn't. The GPG lost the battle, but has won countless hearts. The report. Oh, look at this. Ooh. Recoil co coiling up. The cabinet chamber was empty, as was normal for the immediate aftermath of a regular cabinet session on a Friday afternoon. Only Alfonso Corona del Rosal and Emilio Martinez Manalto remained behind. Facing what they both uh, knew was a greater threat, they visibly represented the repressive urge to snap at each other. Yes, things are finally starting to blow over, but I'll be remiss to feel anything better about things without that being the case, Manalto. Del Rosal sighed and shook his head. Manalto nodded. You're, you're right. You'd be right there, Del Rosal. Dead right. I didn't know our dust could uh, degenerate into such a rage-fueled paranoia. 
The friend I respected the most rational person I know over reacting so viciously to such a minor event. He's back to normal. We can't let him run wild like that. No, you're right there, Manalto. If we let him run wild, it'll be the Porfiriato all over again. At this point, Del Rosal looked at uh, looked Manalto directly in the eyes. You know what I think about the succession if Ordaz kills over tomorrow? I know. I also know what you think, and you know that we disagree. We both think we'd be better than each other, but I believe we have one major thing to agree on, regardless of who takes over. Go on, Manalto responded. The scoundrel Chavera can't be let any closer to power than he is. You and I both know how he preyed on Ordaz's fears for his own game. Who knows what interest that opportunistic parasite really serves? He has to be stopped. Nodding, Manalto leaned back in his chair. I completely agree. Chaveria has to be snipped in the butt before he makes Gustavo suffer any more than he already has. And that's what we're going to do, you and I. The shadow stalks the court, dribbling poison in the monarch's eager ear. You know, this crap seems to be going on all the time. It's Mexico, I guess, you know. First of all, it was like Madrazo and all them conspired to make sure Salinas didn't do well. You know, it, it, this is Mexico. The report. The fifth day today. Or the fifth. Fernando Gutierrez Barrios read the report. Uh, skimmed the body, wrenched open the file cabinet, and dropped the report into the bristling vanilla folder labeled Oaxaca. But the metal drawer did not slide closed with his typical forceful push. Oaxaca and his bulging brethren, Guerrero, Puebla, Sonora, and Chiapas had jammed the one smooth mechanism. His cold eyes stared for a moment, then Gutierrez returned to his desk where he arranged for his jet black typewriter. Its clack soon punctured from the silent air. Federal District, a fundamental challenge to the state authority and proposed response. Guerrilla activity and extremist protests have radically escalated since the September 23rd attack on the Madera barracks and now pose a systematic threat to state stability. While traditional DFS methods will play a crucial role in combating these groups, they alone are no longer sufficient. Our government must study and implement the modern counterinsurgency techniques pioneered by the U.S. and Japan, adapting them to Mexican context. Substantial additional resourcing will be required to do so, but costs can be reduced by reactivating the detention and interrogation centers of the Porfiriato. This existential conflict will necessitate unprecedented coordination between security services and the armed forces. Half measures will not suffice. Only bold decisive action will forestall a revolution. Federal District or Federal Director of Security, Fernando Gutierrez Barrios. So far from God. One step closer, and another. One step, then the next. As all the doctors had ordered. Sterile air, loud, shrill noises, no voice except those of orderlies, some of whom looked visibly worried. Small wonder, he said muttered. The man that ruled the Mexican nation is hobbling like a toddler in front of them. No one from the organizing committee was there. The doctors had driven them away. A pang of bitterness suffused him. God, I want to attend those meetings again. Go help organize the Olympics once again. Would he love to see the fruits of his work? Deep down, I know darn well what the answer is, but enough of that. What was those dang angles like to say about life? Was it not to had, all spent, or instead but a walking shadow? Yes, one, one of those. While thoughts meandered, he kept on struggling forward. He wanted to see something. Something better, actually worth fighting for. Superior to all this, his foolishness, I used to get involved in this pathetic court politics. Everything had gone away. To become president, he had given up so much. His personal life was in tatters. He had, had, had too much fun. He had given Ava too much trouble. He turned a corner and a mural merged in his sight. It portrayed happy, learned people in a wealthy, strong Mexico. What a divine thing to see. How he wanted to see that vision, how he wanted to witness his achievements before he passed on. If it's for that, I've still got a little time left. I can use what little is left of this life of mine to do as much good as possible. Adolfo Lopez Mateos, 55th president of the United Mexican States, stood up straight here. Straighter. Animated by the vision of a rich country and peaceful people, his pace picked up. He kept insisting himself to himself, I still have time. The great president human. Restraint? It was aggression that characterized the new erect form of the president of the United Mexican States. No curse of God or man could inflict any greater harm than sleeplessness and stomach issues. Worsened by the sleeplessness, no doubt, had wrought on Diaz Ordaz's mind and frame. Diaz Ordaz. Echeverria and Baragan looked on, the former bemused and concerned, the latter almost uncharacteristically worried, as Ordaz explained to them the ideological realities behind the ongoing crisis. Isn't it clear to you? Ever since the ten tragic days, ever since those Americans and Germans backed the slaughtered President Madero, it's always been the same darn thing. Scratch any one of those so-called revolutionaries and one, any one of these patriot guerrillas, and you'll find a foreign back subversive. Anyone who dares suggest that the party's rule or the nation is in any way flawed or unjust is also some kind of subversive. Do you hear me? They're all, they're all traitors. At last, out of breath, Ordaz stumbled briefly, stating himself before Baragan or Echeverria could reach out to stabilize his body. Composing himself somewhat, he issued his directives. Your orders, gentlemen, are as follows. Look at the president's set. We only one reasonable response. You will see to it that the connections between these ongoing acts of subversion, anti-state, anti-party treason, and inter international socialism, fascism, and imperialism are investigated. And if you find any proof, as I am certain you will, be resolved here and now that you are to show no mercy, none at all, to any agents of hostile foreign forces. Am I clear? The two officials both nodded. Repressing the amusement they felt at what they were in agreement was a wildly excessive response to the crisis at hand. But that was not enough. Diaz or Diaz raised a finger and pointed at them to punctuate his assistance. No mercy, do you hear me? None. 
Which I honestly totally get at this point, because this is starting to piss me off too now. Dark Horse. Things are stable. Previous disorder seems to be dying down. However, certain confidential DFS reports are more worrying. Signed, Winston Scott. Pulling the letter up, Winston Scott, FBI Bureau in Chief in Mexico City, began to pace in thought. A man of logic such as Ordaz claims to be, acting as viciously as he did in response to such a minor insurrection. Ranting and raving as if Chapultepec was burning down, perhaps I've been giving him too much credit. Scott opened a dossier. I'm going to start uh, need, uh, need to start backing into the horse if Ordaz proves unreliable. I mean, sure, he's given me reassurances, but if he breaks under the weight of his office, we need to pick a side in the succession. Two files sat down in front of him. The first, pertaining to Alfonso Corona del Rosal, met with a brief glance and was put aside. Scott already knew his contents well enough to get by. Ordinarily, it would be del Rosal, no question about it, but these days. Once Scott began to read through another file, putting it on the table next to that of del Rosal. These days, a certain secretary looks to be asserting its own authority. He's had some interesting decisions lately, hasn't he? It's worth considering. And at least I'm not lacking options. Always watching, and soon perhaps more. Can we, what's, hello? Regional Democrats in Southeast and Southwest. We are writing to you urgently for the sake of the revolution and the party itself. Our regions of the Southwest, Michoacan and Guerrero, have been under great strain since counter revolutionaries levied recent and unfounded corruption of the allegations against the local PRI elements, resulting in numerous withdrawals from the investors. Our states are in dire need of wealth, and without your financial aid, we cannot continue any major projects in the region. Without these efforts, from rural construction to the tourism attraction, the states will remain isolated from the rest of Mexico and the world. With their permission, we pledge to uphold the highest standards of transparency and accountability in the use of these funds. We will ensure that every peso is used to meet our citizens' needs, and will provide regular detailed reports on the progress and impact of our projects. Enough will tell Campos to sort this out. Wow, that's really bad. Relief is not the answer to ill discipline. Well, Chiapas has always been firmly agricultural state, and as such, has always been one that is critically dependent on harvest to provide for the people. We're afraid to say that this year's harvest has been poor and it replaced our state budget and thus our citizens in jeopardy. Our administration has prided itself on the cautious and careful use of funds. Still, our region's dependency on our crops has left us with no other choice. Well, your direct intervention, we cannot guarantee that the state will not continue to slide into its ill fortune and destitution. I urge you to consider our people's future. This is incredibly stupid. I'm sorry, but this is so stupid. I did not overgo the budget here. I'm more than certain I did not overgo it at all. And it randomly came up. Now, I could be wrong, and you probably go back in the video and watch me do it. But I'm more than certain I did not go over the budget for any of these places. It just seems random, and I can see why this guy's losing it. I am losing it. Primary or secondary? For a moment, the nation began been in chaos. Luis Echeverria did the only reasonable thing in response. He grew his power in the government. How successful it had been. Looking around at the results of his work, he smiled cruelly. Those fools that thought me a secondary contender next to the people like Del Rosal and Manauto. Not anymore, though. Now they know better. He read some more of the reports in the smile left his face where Daz's behavior is concerning, I mean. If there's one thing I agree with those fools that Del Rosal and Manauto about, it's that he was acting irrationally. Such alarming behavior in response to something that should have been causing no alarm, how is that desirable in a leader? Echeverria sighed slightly, his thoughts moving quickly. But there's still opportunity. There always is. I always wear Daz's bouts of irrationality for my own benefit and play it all slow. I have people like Barrios and Baragan that can rely on while I keep doing what I've been doing. Luis and Cheveria Alvaro straighten up. These United Mexican states cry for a proper leader, one that can bring about the true greatness, the greatness from which they have held back for so long, so one who can build a nation of which Hidalgo and Emperor Qual... Qual... Yeah, Mok can be proud of. Mark my words, I'll be that leader. A knave sets his eyes on the throne. I'm sorry, but between the, the retarded healthcare strike, that was stupid. That was so stupid, it drug out forever. Having extra debt here for no reason? Incredibly stupid. No wonder no Mexico's crazy. Oh, Mexico, not fun. Parts of it are very fun actually. But parts of it oh. And then you have a university gets or not university, but army gets, gets shot at. I mean I can see why our guy is going insane right now. I absolutely can see why. So shifting tides. Papers rustled as the pen juddered across them. A mess of these sounds in other days work in Los Pinos was brought to a finish. Satisfied, Gustavo Diaz Ordaz handed the last of the day's papers to his secretary and made ready for dinner with his wife, Guadalupe. As he wound down, he put his head in his hands. I've overreacted, didn't I? A ten pound hammer for a one inch nail. What screw up all this has been? Raising his head from his hands, Ordaz looked out of the window onto the city. At that distance, the citizenry down on the Avenida, Avenida Constitus, Constituyentes, you can tell I don't speak Spanish, many of whom were returning home at the end of their own day's work, looked like a miniature exhibit. The public fears me. That isn't a bad thing by any means. A healthy dose of fear gives stability and peace, but I can't rule through fear alone. He stood up. 
I trust my own instinct. I believe that reason will prevail over blind, violent emotion, but I can see the vultures circling around my rifle roll from within and without. I must not overreact again, but I can't afford to not be vigilant. Well, Gustavo Diaz Ordaz is the work at end for the day. He had the opposite thought as he went to the dinner table where his wife awaited him. My work has just begun. So finally, that ends the campaign. Mex continues on his implacable course, set from by the revolution, and his captain passes control to his trusted first mate. The new hands sitting on the wheel are those of Gustavo Diaz Ordaz. He has earned the respect of the crew with tireless vigilance, a keen intellect, and precise orders. The Pirai tells a story, hurried and relentless, amidst the gathering storms. They do not speak of the leaks springing up, the girls multiplying, the crew intriguing for rank and favor, the whispers of whispers that Ordaz may be cracking under the strain. His face of stone shows no signs he navigates the Silla of radicalism and the Charidis of reaction. The howls of foreign powers of Mexico's passenger citizens cannot release his iron grip. The course is set, the Dark Knight does not allow deviation. For 1965 and the years to come, Ordaz and PRI in Mexico will plow through any obstacles in the revolution's way. So, well, that's the campaign. I hate how this ended. I absolutely hated how this ended. I mean, we put him in such a bad place. Usually when I play, we play these campaigns, you want to end up better than where we started. And this just tells me I should never play Mexico, man. My God. All the crap we had to deal with at the end, that just it just started crumbling. Mexico just started crumbling under us at the end. And we had to greatly increase our deficit just to have enough political power. If we could tweak a few things here and there, I don't know if the deaths were watching. I'm sure actually one or two of them might be, but just from my opinion, from what I've seen, at the end, we need some a little bit more political power or something here. Just so that we don't have to do temporary tax cuts to destroy us. So that we can get enough to help put down the healthcare crisis, which honestly lasted too long. But maybe I made the wrong choices. Maybe there are other choices we could have made to alleviate that because that really pissed me off so much it's not fucking funny um, you know dealing with all those doctor strikes even though we didn't try to negotiate with them it just they didn't lower their steam at all that made no sense to me but next time now if I ever do Mexico again I know for a fact that I have to kill every last doctor in Mexico apparently every single last one of them and interns mostly the interns I guess but you know whatever it's Mexico um, this stuff was I like the GUI the GUI for the Mexican miracle I thought it was really fantastic at the end, though, I don't understand how we had up more debt, because I was pretty pretty good about watching the debt levels eventually, because did, we did have the uh, issue earlier on in the campaign about it, about having too much debt, and we reduced it, which was great. Um, but I don't know why we had two places that had too much debt, which kind of made me irate as well. Um, you know, it's a story in the end. Ordaz is getting set up to be killed off later. Unfortunately, Lopez Mateos wasn't having a good time either. Uh, he could die before the Olympics. I like, love the idea of the Mexico hosting the Olympics and making Mexico a greater place. Um, I don't know. The story was fine. I thought it was good. The TNO writers are pretty good about doing all this stuff. I just some of the small little things, and they all added up to really piss me off at the end here. It really made me kind of go off the deep rails. So I apologize for that. But Mexico has a lot of potential, just like all of TNO does. Oh, and the devs have done generally a pretty good job. So I apologize for raging earlier, but man, it really fucking pissed me off earlier. But regardless. If you enjoy the campaign, please let me know your thoughts down below. Maybe consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another campaign. Thanks for watching, and have a great, 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 great rest of your day.